Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on Future 500's annual Force for Good forecast report, which captures 10 top emerging trends driving ESG activism and advocacy towards companies. Next slide, please. My name is Eric Wolgamuth, and I'm the COO at Future 500. We're a nonprofit consultancy that builds trust between companies, advocates, investors, and philanthropists to advance business as a force for good. This webinar represents a kickoff of our virtual summit, which we are presenting in collaboration with our wonderful partners at EarthX in celebration of Earth Day 50. Next slide, please. I am joined here by my wonderful team, who I will now invite to turn on their cameras and unmute their mics uh, and briefly introduce themselves, including sharing a favorite book they have read or show that they have seen while quarantined. I'll start. My favorite show has been Hunters with Al Pacino on Amazon Prime. And I want to make a quick plug for Giving Blood, as you can see here, I have my Red Cross shirt on. Um, I have a good friend who runs the Red Cross in the New York area, and they do need uh, blood. So if you can do it, please do so. So thank you, team. Um, I want to turn it over to Andre to introduce herself. Thanks, Eric. Good plug for Giving Blood. I'm Andre Lodinchik, <laughs> and a book that I've been reading right now is uh, The Overstory by Richard Powers. Um, highly recommended if anyone hasn't picked it up. It's awesome. Bill, on to you. Uh, I have been, uh, uh, welcome everybody, glad everybody is here. Uh, uh, I have been uh, uh, focused on modern family reruns uh, with my uh, kids, uh, but also reading this book called In This Together by Trammell Crow and some guy named Bill Shireman, which I highly recommend to all of you. You'll hear about that more later. <laughs> Brendan. Good, good plug, Bill. This is Brendan Steele here out of our future, out of our San Francisco office. And on Netflix, I've of course been binging Tiger King, but what I really recommend is the show Ugly Delicious for those who are foodies and into cooking. Hmm, haven't seen that one. Hi everyone, I'm Ellen Griesemer. Uh, I am also based in San Francisco. And I am very close to the end of a strange novel called Smoke. All right. Uh, last and surely least. Hi, everyone. My name is Kellen. I'm a director based out of uh, my bedroom in Portland, Oregon. And I, too, have been watching that Tiger show that everyone has been talking about lately. Yes, it's Daniel Tiger. I watch it every morning with my two-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, team. So let's talk about what's ahead. And as I mentioned earlier, this webinar is the kickoff of our virtual summit at EarthX. We have a series of provocative and compelling sessions planned for this month starting this Thursday, featuring senior leaders from BP and Nestle talking about net zero and sustainability in an age of polarization. We certainly have a lot of polarization lately. To learn more about the speakers and topics, you can go to future500.org slash summit. Next slide, please. I want to take a moment to recognize our partner EarthX, an international nonprofit environmental forum whose purpose is to educate and inspire people to action towards a more sustainable future. Founded by our board member, Trammell S. Crow, EarthX has grown into the largest physical Earth Day and environmental event on the planet, and also the most diverse. EarthX really epitomizes the slogan we are widely hearing used today, we are all in this together. Next slide, please. I also want to recognize EarthX's biggest sponsor, Smurfit Kappa, which is Europe's leading corrugated packaging company and one of the leading paper-based packaging companies in the world. Really, thanks to Smurfit Kappa, they're really making all these virtual summits possible for us, so thank you. Uh, next slide, please. And now it is my distinct privilege to introduce the CEO of EarthX, Tony Keene, to share in two to three minutes information on all amazing things that EarthX has planned this month and for later this year. It is quite an audacious challenge to pivot and take the world's largest physical environmental event in the world and move it online. But one thing I do know for sure is Texans know how to get things done. So Tony, can you please turn on your camera, unmute yourself and uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Eric, appreciate that. Yes, it's uh, been a big uh, task to take uh, the largest event and the environment and convert it to a virtual event. So that's what we've been doing. And so we now will have a, a virtual 50th anniversary and we will be able to create a, an opportunity for our key speakers to be able to do live streaming and then merging also with our film festival. Uh, we've got a great lineup for Wednesday, April 22nd. So we encourage you to tune in for that. 
as well as then on the Thursday and the Friday and the Saturday and the Sunday as we continue to go through that weekend that we were going to originally have EarthX, we want to now be able to bring to you as many of the speakers as possible so that you can still see and hear that uh, great content that we were planning to present in April. In addition to this, we will now be launching a year-long uh, virtual type of presence with a lot of our speakers that we're going to be um, on our stages throughout the event previously that now you'll be able to listen to uh, throughout the year, as well as uh, look, tune in every week for different events and different highlights of a live streaming event for the rest of the year. Several of our conferences, um, our EarthX um, Energy, our EarthX Legal, and our EarthX Tech for Good conferences will actually be postponed to October, where we'll actually do a live conference at our Half Earth Day event on October 22nd, as well as our gala is being postponed now until September 26th. So we encourage you to participate and attend those live events later this year. So we help, help you uh, in terms of getting access to this content. Please go to earthx.org where you'll see more details and more information about all the wonderful speakers and look forward to bringing in Tia Nelson, the daughter of Gaylord Nelson, who is the originator of Earth Day on April 22nd. And that will start at 2.30 in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, and your team. I hope you're all doing well and, uh, and keeping safe. So please say hi from all of us here at, uh, at Future 500. Uh, next slide, please. So let's dive into our forecast. Um, each year, our team convenes around Thanksgiving to pool our expertise to identify the top ESG trends we anticipate will shape engagement between corporations and external stakeholders in the coming year and beyond. And to arrive at our predictions, we look at trends in advocacy, philanthropy, investing, and politics, combined with invaluable insights that we glean from thought leaders in our network. And it's a, it's a fun exercise. Uh, the 2020 edition is our ninth annual trends report. We've gotten pretty good at this, helping leaders see around the corner on issues like plastic, environmental justice, and zero deforestation. Uh, next slide, please. So here are the top 10 issues for 2020. Our team will be presenting on each of them. So let's dive into the one on the top left, which focuses on COVID-19's impact on corporate reputation. We added this issue uh, at last minute as it, as it affects all the other nine issues in our forecast. So companies, large and small, how they respond to this crisis is a defining moment that will be remembered for decades. In a world where we live in now with near immediate transparency and deep polarization, companies must tread really carefully as missteps will fuel the narrative of corporations versus the people. Coronavirus is shining a spotlight on each company's purpose and how each company's leadership upholds that purpose. COVID influences every issue in our forecast, as I mentioned. For example, how companies treat and engage their employees could influence loyalty, productivity, and a company's reputation for many years to come. How might consumers perceive a company getting bailout money while laying off workers and not cutting CEO and senior leader salaries? Will investors focus on ESG reporting and transparency continue to rise? Will scrutiny of corporate influence on politics increase? Next slide, please. To help companies navigate these treacherous waters, we identified two useful studies from MIT and Harvard. Um, there are four points that summarize the bottom line here for all of you. First, be proactive, be straight, and over-communicate with your employees. Second, focus your support locally and encourage your employees to volunteer in the communities where you operate. Third, find strategic partners on solutions so you can scale for impact, such as foundations, local governments, philanthropists, et cetera. And fourth, get your messaging right. Please uh, steer clear of anything that sniffs of profiteering. And in the face of uh, rising wealth disparity, you need to be very sensitive to issues of equity and fairness. Uh, a good example I already mentioned is CEO pay. You really don't want to be perceived as tone deaf. So I'm now going to pass it to Ellen to talk about employee engagement. Thanks, Eric. So this trend tracks the evolution of employees as activist movement that we've been closely following. Tech workers became the vanguard of employee agitation on ESG issues, including climate change, gun sales, sexual harassment policies, and controversial government contracts. Social media has been a critical tool for rapid mobilization on petitions, walkouts, and the coordination of shareholder resolutions. So, uh, hey, Ellen, so what's, uh, what's actually new here then? So we've couched this trend as activists and employees joining forces. This trajectory was already cementing 
a new phase in activism pre-COVID. So last summer, in a first-of-its-kind collaboration, Google employees co-created shareholder proposals with community activists and investors, and also held a joint rally outside an Alphabet shareholder meeting. New platforms like Bill Wiles Climate Voice are launching with the express purpose of engaging employees as well. Next slide, please. The critical situation that we're in now has actually only strengthened this employee campaigner collaboration. A coalition of tech workers voiced support for Amazon's warehouse protesters and campaigners like United for Respect are advocating on behalf of workers. The pandemic has also propelled the voices of more traditional labor stakeholders like unions back into the conversation. The fast food worker protest shown on the right, which took place just two days ago, was supported by Fight for 15, the minimum wage focused union. Hey, hey, Alan, can I interject quick? Uh, it, it may be too soon to say, but, um, uh, but given the economic uncertainty COVID's bringing, um, are, what are some of the ways the pandemic you think is going to shift employee activism uh, in a lasting way? Yeah, so I think a couple things here. So first, if there's ever been a recent national moment for strengthening workplace benefits, it's definitely now. So expect activists and employees to push companies into adopting some of these health and safety measures more permanently, permanently, such as sick pay in the restaurant industry. And two, if changing employee expectations are not met, anticipate that unions will stick around as part of this employee advocate collaboration. And then finally, I think a lot of this in this together mindset will live on in a post COVID world and employees will return their focus to other pressing issues like climate change. Thanks, thanks, Alan. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Bill Weil, just a. Uh, a note that you can hear more about uh, his new Climate Voice platform on our upcoming webinar as part of this summit. Uh, and it's titled Mobilizing Employees for Sustainability Action. It's uh, April 22nd at 10 a.m. Pacific. So now I'm going to turn it over to Andrea. All right. Thanks, Ellen. So I think we've all seen this trend unfold pretty spectacularly in our own backyards and our communities. Uh, youth activists have had immense success in elevating climate and social issues in public discourse. And today's youth movement is louder, more urgent, and it's more capable of waging an information campaign on social media than any of its predecessors. So it's important to understand their theory of change and expectations because their discontent with the status quo seems to be a sign of what's to come. Hey, hey uh, Andrea, uh, can I, as I mentioned earlier, youth are going to form lifelong opinions of companies based on how they are acting today. So how do you see youth activism influencing corporate behavior now? Yeah, so in the U.S., the focus of many of these groups has been on political mobilization. Um, it's not 100% clear what role they see the private sector playing and how they're going to engage with business, uh, but we've already seen activists stage protests on Wall Street and at a number of different company headquarters. Uh, so plenty of indication that they're going to use different leverage points like civil disobedience. Uh, and because many of them are calling this a systemic problem, we could also see activists pushing business to move from action to advocacy and use their political influence. So you, you think they can maintain this momentum, especially given the uh, COVID-19 crisis? And that's a good question and the one on everyone's mind and uh, there are a lot of variables at play. So it's obviously going to make on the ground organizing more difficult. Uh, but we've seen that activists are standing their ground and they're exploring more tools for online organizing. Uh, so for kids who are at home and they're looking to be a part of something greater than themselves right now, this kind of messaging could resonate um, and it could be a test case for the future of online activism. Another thing also to keep an eye on will be philanthropy. So climate funders began to back protest movements in big numbers last year. Um, will their priorities shift or will they double down on this and give activists some staying power? And I think that remains to be seen. Hey, uh, so, Andrea, I wanted to just make a, make a, a point uh, responding to a question by Bruce uh, Kraft. Uh, whoops, I forgot your last name, Bruce. Klafner, right? Um, and that is that small and medium enterprises uh, will all, are also a part of this, but many, uh, uh, many uh, uh, activist elements will be more mutual aid elements. Millions of people are joining in local engagements to just do things themselves now, and small and medium enterprises are a central part of that. So I guess building on uh, Bill's question, what can companies do to get in front of this? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is don't ignore it. 
Um, I think that risks falling out of step with an entire generation of your future customers, employees, shareholders, and communities. Uh, it's important to be proactive, you know, keep track of what they're asking for, think about how you can align your messaging with growing movements, um, and make sure that your sustainability practices are integral to your business in order to attract young talent and to stay competitive. Um, so, you know, if, if done right, this could really be an opportunity to think about how to provide value for future stakeholders. That's great. Uh, thank you. Hey, uh, Kellen, on to you now. Great. Thanks, Eric. So for the millions of loyal followers that have been uh, following along with our annual forecast for the past nine years, this trend might sound a, a little bit familiar because it's essentially an evolution of the brands taking stands trend that we've highlighted in prior reports and really a, a sibling trend to both the employee activism and youth activism trends that Ellen and Andrea just highlighted. How we've seen this trend evolve over the past few years has essentially gone like this. First, brands had to figure out, what do we stand for as a company? And then once they had defined more of a corporate purpose, they started sharing that with customers saying, this is what we care about. Isn't that great? Buy our products because of what we care about. But now they're realizing that even that's not enough and that if they really want to earn the loyalty of values-driven consumers, they can't just talk about how great they are. They also need to be offering something more tangible to consumers, particularly Gen Zs and millennials who are often feeling helpless, disempowered, and craving solutions on big messy topics like climate change. So now what we're seeing is that leading brands are saying, this is what we care about. And if you care about this too, here are some explicit ways that we can take action together. But importantly, we see this trend as not just being about customer loyalty. It's also companies realizing, oh shoot, we can't tackle these systemic issues by ourselves, let alone achieve the bold sustainability goals that we've laid out. We need an army. And so they're looking to their customers as other additional potential allies on big systemic change like policy and behavioral shifts. Hey, uh, Kellen, just a, a quick question here. Which, which companies and uh, stakeholders are, paying, are you paying close attention to as this trend kind of evolves over the coming years? Sure. Uh, well, on the on the corporate side of things, you know, I think we'll be uh, first and foremost looking to some of the usual suspects like the Patagonias, the REIs, the Ben and Jerry's of the world who have been real sustainability bellwethers on the corporate side, I guess you could say. Um, and broader sectors as well, like the outdoor industry that have already indicated they're quick, eager to assert their values. Um, it'll be interesting to see if other sectors follow suit and try to mimic them, particularly as a way to re-engage customers post-COVID. On the NGO side of things, I'll be looking to some of the big green NGOs like the Nature Conservancy and Audubon Society that have been crafting their own action toolkits around things like climate change for consumers and that are probably eager to secure some additional corporate partners. But then we'll also be looking at the scrappy grassroots coalitions that have the eyes of Gen Z and millennial consumers, groups like Fashion Revolution or Youth Climate Strike that have their BS meter turned up really high to make sure that what companies are doing is genuine. Thanks, Kellen. And with uh, that, I think, Eric, it's back to you for the next trend. Yeah, next slide, please. There it is. Great. Um, so let's look at issue five. Is ESG investing taking over Wall Street? Uh, again, another issue we've tracked the last several years, and as many of you know, um, we've long tracked the priorities of socially responsible investors as indicators for what mainstream Wall Street investors will ultimately integrate into their investment models. So it's really not surprising now that mainstream passive investors are now increasingly integrate ES, integrating ESG screens into their financial models and product offerings. This increase is really due to several factors, but the, the biggest driver is growing interest among institutional and high net worth investors seeking lower risk portfolios, which ESG screen funds have tended to provide. So COVID-19 and the, the sharp drop in the market suggest that this trend will only accelerate. A reason is that investments, again, with more active ESG screens are performing better in this market downturn than non-ESG funds, as suggested by one of the article headlines on this slide. There are uh, four stakeholder types we're watching, and these include SRIs like Trillium and Walden Asset Management and the ICCR network, more activist institutional investors like Norgus Bank, that's the uh, Norwegian Pension Fund, and State Street investor coalitions like Climate Action 100 and, and activist groups like Stand Out Earth and Mighty who are really helping coordinate NGOs and investors and in campaigns targeting Wall Street firms like BlackRock and JP Morgan Chase. So to summarize a, a bottom line here, we anticipate three things. Investors of all types, well first, investors of all types will increasingly expect more robust 
ESG disclosure and transparency by companies. Uh, ESG, or second, ESG integration will continue spreading across asset classes. So for example, there's been a notable pivot by hedge funds recently into ESG. Uh, and third, and lastly, we expect more activist campaigns targeting investors and banks. Ellen, back to you. Thanks, Eric. Consumer concerns about the impacts of linear models have grown as more consumers connect the dots between unchecked consumption and climate change, deforestation and plastic pollution. And circular economy is really resonating in a new way with many of these consumers. So we've seen a recent proliferation of alternative models on the rise. Major retailers think Nordstrom, Macy's, Gap have launched resale programs for apparel. Re-commerce sites like ThreadUp anticipate that secondhand apparel will outpace fast fashion within the next 10 years. This image of a tag requesting clothes be returned to the brand when you're finished with them is one I snapped from my own closet. And then on the right here, TerraCycle's pilot program Loop, which launched last year, is a refillable shopping model that counts some of the biggest brands as partners. P&G, Unilever, Nestle, Pepsi, and Coca-Cola, among others. And while the COVID pandemic may be causing some brands and consumers to press pause on take back or refill, environmental advocates are loudly pushing back on fears about hygiene risks. And Tara Cycle CEO has indicated in an interview recently that loop orders are actually up during this time. So while there are some open circular economy questions, for example, advocates remain torn over the role of plastics. To position themselves well for this trend, companies should ensure that recyclability is not just an endpoint. Stakeholders will be increasingly dissatisfied with impact targets that are not tied to any underlying business model transformation. And companies that are slow to get on board may find their social license under scrutiny, as some stakeholders and media outlets are asking broader questions about the role of our industrial systems. It remains to be seen if a serious shift towards circular economy models will head off or even shift this more macro conversation. Hey, Ellen. Um, you know, this issue space of the circular economy has uh, exploded in the last couple of years. It's funny, I just heard a recycling truck outside. <laughs> so, uh, so who are some of the, the stakeholders to watch in, in the circular economy space? Yeah, for sure. There are many, many players in this space. And you're right, it really has exploded. So we're keeping an eye on mainstreamers and thought leaders like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the World Resources Institute, Cradle to Cradle. We're also really watching campaigners, especially with a plastics focus, like the Break Free from Plastic Movement and Greenpeace, as well as shareholder advocacy organizations like As You Sew, and investors that are really focused on circular economy issues like Closed Loop Partners, as well as circular economy enabling companies like TerraCycle and reverse logistics innovators like Tro, formerly known as Yertle. So there are so many players in the space and those are just a handful. And uh, with that, I will hand it off to Brendan. Great, thank you, Ellen. Our seventh trend, regenerative agriculture, has generated a lot of buzz this year, and for good reason. Proponents of the farming and ranching strategy say that it has the potential to restore soil health and in the process, sequester carbon, boost biodiversity, and even yield healthier food. Hey, 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 Brandon, that's, uh, that's a pretty tall order. So uh, uh, is it going to deliver? You know, that's the question on everyone's mind. Critics say that at least so far, it's too narrowly scoped to deliver such sweeping results. And consensus even on certification, let alone a definition of regenerative ag, remains elusive. Nonetheless, we've seen companies like General Mills, Danone, and Hormel sign on with sizable commitment. It's uncertain yet if the COVID-19 pandemic and the potential for food insecurity and supply chain disruption will put the brakes on these efforts or speed them up. Keep an eye on the Carbon Underground and the Rodale Institute as they align on best practices and recruit a larger pool of companies to back bigger initiatives. Hey, hey Brendan. Um, so when, when folks are talking about regenerative ag, you know, I hear a lot about soil health and, and frankly about cattle. So where do, where do workers fit in, especially in the places like the developing world? Good question. You know, Eric, that's key. You know, we've highlighted in our forecast reports for a number of years now, equity and environmental justice. Companies, as well as the NGOs backing regenerative agriculture, 
are leaving themselves open to criticism if they don't fully carry the social side along with the environmental. Rainforest Alliance is a good example for how to do this in the global south. And with that, we'll take it to the next slide. Great. Well, in 2019, we gave you a heads up that a cool $4 billion in funding for climate protection would be coming down the pipes. That number has since ballooned four times to over 16 billion with a stunning infusion of 10 billion alone from Jeff Bezos. Now climate commitments rolled in right up until the pandemic started. So it remains to be seen how philanthropic efforts may shift with the immediate global crisis at hand. But advocates and funders are staring down 2030 climate goals with now less than a decade to go. We expect this sense of urgency will kick funders back into high gear soon after the crisis abates. And we expect advocates will start putting the money to work. Hey, hey Brennan, you know, we, we uh, you know, our team tracks philanthropy closely because we look at it as a bellwether for what companies and advocates should have on their radar. So, um, you know, can you connect the dots here for, for the companies and advocates that are joining us today? Sure. You know, each of these commitments will flow in different directions and small grants can make big change. The relative modest funding we've seen from Rory Kennedy and Eileen, Gennady, Eileen Getty, and those two names of the Kennedy and Getty clans, has kicked new life into teen activism and extinction, extinction rebellion. What if even just some of that money flows into employee activism? And I'm sure that Bill Weil, who Eric, you mentioned earlier, will have some thoughts there when he joins us on April 22nd. So if you're a private sector leader, prepare now to engage your critics on your climate commitments and position yourself for leadership before this opportunity flips to risk. Where all that money lands and how it is used will, will have major implications for all companies, especially those in consumer facing as well as carbon intensive sectors. And with that, I'm passing it now to Andrea and next slide. Thanks, Brendan. So political transparency has come under increasing scrutiny recently. We're seeing more stakeholders criticize companies whose public commitments aren't aligned with their political contributions or their lobbying. Um, investors in particular have been pointing to this as a significant reputational risk. And they've been publicly calling on companies to disclose their political spending and to review their memberships and trade associations that are promoting agendas at odds with their stated goals. Um, so we've seen a number of companies respond BP, Equinor, Total, and Shell have all left industry groups because of their stance on climate policy. Uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi broke ties with the Plastic Industry Association. And then hundreds of companies have left Alec uh, in the last few years. So there's a lot of pressure to align tone and deed right now. Hey, um, Andrea, you know, so you, you noted that investors have had their eye on this issue for, for many years, but you know, how are other stakeholders reacting? Yeah, other stakeholders are getting increasingly involved. Watchdog groups like the Center for Political Accountability and Influence Map, among others, are analyzing lobbying registries and public databases to connect the dots. And so companies can't count on their political activity to remain secret anymore. Um, and because of increased transparency, employees and customers are becoming less tolerant of what they perceive as uh, hypocrisy on this issue. And then groups like Bill Wiles Climate Voice that we've mentioned a number of times already, um, are, they're working on mobilizing employees around corporate advocacy in particular. And then on the other side of the same coin, uh, environmental advocates and others are making it clear that voluntary corporate action, while laudable, um, is not enough to raise the bar for entire industries. So stakeholders are calling on companies to use their political influence to advocate for issues like carbon pricing or gun control at the state and federal level. Um, and given the COVID-19 crisis and the fact that this is likely to be the most polarizing election ever, people will be heavily scrutinizing corporate behavior and campaign donations. Um, so for companies that have been reticent to be political, you know, things are changing. And this is now an opportunity for you know, companies to build trust with stakeholders by being more transparent and practicing corporate political responsibility. Hey, uh, Andre, I'm just going to interject real quick because it's a good opportunity, what you just said, for me to plug another one of our upcoming webinars for the summit uh, about how companies and investors can restore trust in democracy. 
Uh, this is going to be featuring Elizabeth Doty, who is the National Program Leader for Business for American Promise, and Rick Alexander, the founder of the, the Shareholder Commons. They're, they have a fascinating um, initiative that they're focused on where they're trying to mobilize corporations and investors to, to um, help restore trust and democracy. So um, pass it back to, I guess, Kellen now. Thank you, Andrea. That was, that was great. All right. So our final trend for 2020 that we wanted to highlight is called net zero meets embedded oil. And what this really boils down to is the growing alignment between historically disparate campaigns that are united by raising awareness of the fossil fuel embedded. You're breaking up now, Kim. It wouldn't be a, a webinar if there wasn't one technical glitch. So I'm glad I could fall on that sword for everyone. Uh, if it persists, y'all let me know. All right. On the one hand, uh, over the past few years, we've seen keep it in the ground style campaigns that have been working hard to slow or stop major energy infrastructure and also secure corporate commitments to science-based targets that will bring emissions down to net zero by mid-century. Meanwhile, over in the plastic pollution camp, we've seen campaigners secure widespread bans on single-use plastic, and they're keen to expand their focus. And yet, global camp demand for plastic is surging, greenhouse gas emissions are too, and Perhaps the most disconcerting to both of these activist camps is that uh, companies are investing billions of dollars in massive new petrochemical facilities around the world. And so what these plastic and climate campaigners have recognized is we really need a united front that stigmatizes fossil fuels across the entire value chain from extraction to pipeline to plastic consumer products. So now we're seeing groups like from coalitions like the Break Free from Plastic movement focusing on the plastic pollution end of the supply chain but while simultaneously more closely coordinating with groups combating fossil fuel extraction and petrochemical developments and really meeting in the middle as well to look at where that oil is embedded in our everyday lives. So unified messaging, but for tailored audiences, geographies, and sectors. So hey, uh, Kellen, so do you, do you anticipate that you know, advocates and campaigners are gonna hone in on specific geographic or sectoral hotspots? Yeah, well, Sectorally, uh, petrochemical development, as I mentioned, is I think going to be a huge area of focus, and that in turn leads to specific geographic areas of focus uh, here in the United States, most notably the Gulf Coast and Appalachia. So that'll be a combination between local groups and more national or multinational groups deploying in those geographies. I think we're also going to see uh, campaigners increasingly call out the impact of global brands in developing countries where both plastic pollution and climate change are hitting really hard. So that'll be Southeast Asia, maybe increasingly Africa as well. Um, sectorally, beyond petrochemical development, I think we're going to see a bigger focus on consumer packaged goods, particularly the beverage sector, who has long been a favorite target of these campaigners. Um, but I think apparel and footwear is going to be another major area of focus, particularly around fossil-derived materials like polyester, but also around the intersection between climate change and human rights issues, both here domestically and in developing countries. That's great. That's great. Thank you, Kellen. Um, so let's move on to our fearless founder, Bill Shireman, who's going to talk about activism and advocacy before and after COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kellen. And thanks to everybody on our team for doing a great job with this. Uh, all of the trends that we've just gone through are trends that we're seeing through the perspective of uh, the end of 2019 before co uh, uh, coronavirus and with modifications based on coronavirus. But the one recognition that I would like to leave everyone with is that COVID changes everything. It is an inflection point in history. It triggers a variety of counter trends that will now change every trend that we've been going through. We are, uh, many of us experiencing great pain uh, and great loss during this time. Every one of us is experiencing change during this time. And I wanna to point to one element of change that's particularly important to understand. We have continuing the demand it from them psychology of activism that was there primarily before uh, COVID. Uh, and that is we're demanding that companies uh, use and supply less oil, gas, and plastic. Uh, we are demanding that we protect global climate with clean energy. And when we're not busy demanding, a lot of our kids are uh, busy uh, uh, with uh, video warfare. What COVID has done is it has 
shocked us into actually working together at the local level, as well as intensified our dependence on these outside institutions. So we're likely to have an intensification of demands on institutions, corporate, government, and so on, at the same time that we're learning to do things together. And that creates a great family of opportunities for companies to focus on smarter and cleaner and help us live lives that are smarter and cleaner, to help us to protect global health with clean everything, not just global climate, with clean energy. Global health and all the factors that go into global health, including climate change, ocean protection, and so on, these will all be great opportunities for moving together. And people will be engaging in more digital activism, not just demanding things, but actually causing things to happen with how they spend their money, with how they converse on issues. Next slide. So we have the shock that, uh, that uh, has been imposed and is changing everything. It is a prism through which everything, uh, uh, everything is scattered uh, uh, that was before. And it is also an inflection point for all of our trends. Now, we're experiencing- Bill, pain. Yeah. So quick question. So it's a shock. So maybe you're gonna be going in this direction, but a shock yeah. in terms of a way that's gonna, you know, how can companies really lean into this, this yes. dynamic that you're, you're framing? Yeah, how can companies lean in? First of all, recognize that people are experiencing fear and pain, uh, and these all create market needs that companies uh, are going to be in a position to fill. We're more afraid of germs, we're more afraid of crowds. Uh, that means the events that we go to are going to be different. Uh, we're afraid of job loss and insecurity. Uh, that's why people are going to be looking for that job security. We're afraid of global threats of all kinds, and we're, some of us, afraid of China. At the same time, we have lots of hopes. Here we are at home, we're experiencing our families more, well, I'm speaking personally, and, uh, uh, and, and a sense of meaning and purpose. There's a, there's a threat out there, it's bringing us all together in global unity, and we're looking at China and saying, how come their government works and ours is having some problems? So what can companies do during this transition. Well, if you want to be a company doing good, help us with better digital connections. Connect more like human beings, number one. Number two, serve our two homes. There may be a relocalization of the economy and culture after this. Of course, these are guesstimates uh, 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 based on some historical experiences. Uh, but we may be living more in our homes and more in our very local communities, as well as globally and digitally, but a little bit less in the middle, in that, in that vast middle of suburbs and, uh, and big cities and so on. So empower us, number three, empower us to do it ourselves. Uh, it's kind of the Home Depot approach. You know, we can do it. You companies can help. And number four, help us clean it, keep it clean and close. Uh, help us to uh, thrive with less travel, lower carbon, less oil and gas, uh, with more work-life balance, uh, and from wherever in the world we are. These will lead to some kind of transformation, an energy transition, which was already in process, a food transition, which had begun and may be accelerating, a cultural status transition where we value different things than we did before, and a lifestyle transition where we live more locally and connect more globally. So Kellen, on to you. Great. Well, thanks everyone for uh, being such engaged participants throughout. We've had a lot of great Q&A moving in and we're now gonna move into that now. Just a reminder of who's going to be answering your questions. I'm going to invite uh, our esteemed team to turn on your videos, although I think I might keep mine off due to the technical glitches from earlier. Uh, this is our team, and it really takes a team to pull this report together every year and pool all of our insights. So kudos and thanks to all of us who have been working on this for a while. Special shout out to our marketing and communications coordinator, Clara Salter, who lives and breathes this for about 24-7, 365. Next slide. So here again is a reminder of what all the issues are as we move into the q and I've already got a bunch teed up here, but please feel free to be throwing more in. Uh, we will be sending out the slides to all registrants after this, don't worry. Um, and with that, let's 
move into some slides and I'll invite my uh, teammates to turn on your video if you would like during the Q&A session. Let's, uh, let's move it back up to the top and a couple of questions about uh, COVID-19. Bill, this one seems uh, like a little bit of a softball for you, so I'm going to put you on the spot. A uh, question coming in from Ron Abbott at Chevron Phillips. Uh, with COVID-19, you highlighted smarter and cleaner. These seem like really uh, compelling opportunities. Do you feel like this is an inflection point to increase human empathy as opposed to polarization, which we've seen particularly you know, here, but elsewhere as well? I, I really do, and thank you for that softball, but it, it does play to my, uh, uh, my presumptions and hopes, so I want to challenge it a little bit. I think that we will have an intensification of some of the polarizing uh, approaches that we've had. Uh, there is a sense, I believe, on the part of climate activists, some climate activists, that this is the time to move in and kill. Uh, sorry for the overemphasis there, but but it really is like the 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 fossil fuel sector is is weakened. Now let's attack even more. I think that it will backfire terribly, but I think we have a very promising uh, 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 counter to that, which is everybody is ready to work together. We have seen an explosion in in this together as a hashtag uh, and a posting and in everybody's speeches. We're in this together. So that's something to ride because it will help us to actually use the energy here to solve the problems and not spend more billions on uh, combat. Great, thanks, Bill. Another question sticking with COVID-19 for a while, this comes from uh, Brian Cooley. There's a possibility that COVID-19 could have significant impacts for the next 18 months. And within that, there's a risk of economic and societal breakdowns in parts of Africa and Asia, which could reshape supply chains. Brian highlights that we're already seeing negative impacts to production of pharma ingredients in China and final drug production in India, including India banning the export of drugs. So his question, do you feel that campaigners could start trying to force domestic production of items that are considered strategic priorities? Is that an area of focus? I'll leave it up to the team to whoever wants to chime in here. I Sorry, uh, 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 Eric, did you want to answer first? No, go for it. Okay. I clearly think that that is a possibility and potentially a healthy one for us. We live in a single coextensive global ecosystem right now, which in nature is a very dangerous place to be. When the entire ecosystem is interconnected, so one problem in one place destroys the whole, that's a dangerous place. An ecological approach is to create more wholeness within these circles. So it will be healthier if we can relocalize some of our economies, uh, uh, complex localization in the midst of globalization. There will be demands by folks who want insurance that we have our domestic industries all here. So there will be some demands, hardcore top-down demands for that. But there will also be a bottom-up supply growth, I think, where people will start more initiatives at the local level. And it's very important for our big global companies to be helpful at the local level with that diversification. So, so Bill, you're talking about designing resilient local systems, in essence. The, the whole economy is more, the whole globe is more resilient when, uh, when there is local resilience and where problems that start locally stay local, that there are enough borders uh, to prevent problems like a problem in a, in a wet market in China from becoming a global catastrophe. I could go down a rabbit hole here, but I won't. Let's hear more questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, Bill, just one thing I'll add to that is echoing this, uh, this concept of resilience. You know, I think that's, something that campaigners have trumpeted for a long time in relation to climate change and said it's very simply into what a post-COVID-19 global economy looks like. Mm -hmm. um, let's move to employee activism for a second. There are a couple questions that came in regarding uh, companies that might not be consumer facing that are more B2B. What is employee, oh, sorry, you know what? I'm reading from the wrong one. I was calling customers to action. So we'll go to that one. Calling customers to action. Uh, there were a couple questions that came in regarding uh, the motivations of B2B companies and what does that look like when they're trying to engage their customers that not, might not be end consumers. Uh, I can chime in there, but uh, happy to let other people take it first. 
Why don't you go, Kellen? I think it's kind of a supply right. chain play. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think um, what we are seeing is that calling customers to action in this broader trend of brands taking stands that we've been talking about for years is cascading further and further up the supply chain. So, yes, for those that are end consumer facing companies, they are, you know, have a much more prominent expectation from their consumers as to engaging and taking a stand on these issues. But increasingly, as those brands and retailers become more engaged and more vocal about how they're engaging on these issues, not only are they looking downstream or, you know, further down to their customers, but they're also looking upstream and looking for partners from their supply chain to get engaged. So if you do not have end consumers that you might be engaging on these issues, you can probably expect that whomever you're selling to is increasingly going to be asking you to participate in broader advocacy aligned with their sustainability priorities. Anyone else want to add to that? I was just going to add one thing about why it would be important to foster this kind of collaboration because we're hearing this now with even smaller private companies that are operating in the B2B space, um, that they're beginning to get a lot of ESG questions from their investors as well. So those, if they have, if they're in the debt markets, um, their lenders are now beginning to ask them a lot of questions or their insurers are. So I think it's one of these things where companies, it's very good to be proactive and trying to work with your customers on these things and finding alignment. Great. Kellen, right. I just wanted to jump in real quick because we also had a somewhat similar question regarding circular economy um, with respect to B2B companies. And while we focused on you know, more of a consumer angle um, with this trend because there's been so much consumer attention, um, just wanted to mention that um, this is extremely relevant for B2B companies as well. And Kellen, like you mentioned with, um, with, with the trend you discussed, we're seeing kind of that pressure from different points in the supply chain. So whether, you know, for a consumer facing brand, maybe you're seeing it from the consumers for B2Bs, we're seeing companies looking up and down the supply chain and saying, well, I, I'm starting to deal with my scope one and two emissions, but I know I need to engage the rest of my supply chain, for example, to start dealing with my scope three emissions. So a lot of examples of various points of engagement um, for circular economy initiatives along the supply chain. Absolutely. There was another question here. Um, it was in relation to calling customers to action, but I think it's really relevant to quite a few of these. And it was, where do you see companies housing their call to customer action internally? Is it marketing, communications, or sustainability? And my answer to that would be yes. Um, all of the above. I think what we're seeing is a lot more internal collaboration between these departments. You know, sustainability is the thought leader experts on this. Marketing communications knows how to make it sexy. And they need to be combining, combining together to make these uh, campaigns compelling, even if you're engaging up, uh, upstream in your supply chain as well. Uh, what we've seen from quite a few companies is that they have a dedicated purpose communications department folded into broader sustainability or marketing and communications that can help catalyze these messages and carry them forward for the long term. Let's switch to uh, a couple other trends here. How about going to uh, ESG? There was a, an anonymous question that came in that with the expectation that ESG disclosures will continue to grow, do you foresee specific frameworks being utilized over others and will this be industry specific? And there was a similar question just around uh, the impact that COVID-19 will have on ESG expectations from a policy and disclosure perspective. So uh, maybe we can fold those together. Yeah. Okay, you wanna go first? Sure, I can chime in on that um, around the expectation ESG disclosures and specific frameworks. Um, we're seeing investors coalesce around three primary frameworks, which will probably come as no surprise to everyone. Uh, TCFD, SASB, and GRI have been the front runners. Usually companies will choose one or the other, but we've seen a number of companies sort of report against all three and provide indexes in their reports. Um, in terms of you know, whether one industry is uh, looking at one or the other, the finance sector, extractives, manufacturing, the oil and gas industry have been focused in particular on disclosing against TCFD because of the climate scenario analyses and because of the focus uh, on investors. And of course, there are reasons to report against one or the other. It's a very individual decision for companies, and I think that really depends on what their goals are, what audience they're trying to reach. Um, GRI is trying to kind of frame what is the impact 
that organizations are having on the world. Um, and SASB kind of looks at the world's impact on the company. And then SASB attempts to look at the financial materiality of issues. So it's naturally more oriented to companies who are trying to reach investors. Um, GRI disclosures will generally speak to a larger audience uh, of stakeholders like customers, employees, um, suppliers, et cetera. So SASB does have industry specific disclosures and, and GRI is also developing sector standards. So um, it, there's really kind of no one that makes more sense for a specific company or an industry. And, you know, there are some initiatives to try to align GRI and SASB to TCFD to make it easier for companies that are using those frameworks to also report to TCFD. So it remains to be seen um, what comes out of some of those efforts. So I'll kind of pause there and see if anyone wants to add anything on, uh, on frameworks and ESG disclosures. The only thing I was going to add is um, I think the, the frameworks that you laid out are, the, are the, the, the correct ones from the perspective of one of the corporate roundtable or corporate working group uh, speakers coming up, uh, Derek Binger from Goldman Sachs. I think he echoes the SASB, GRI, and um, uh, what was the other one you mentioned? Uh, TCFD. TCFD, sorry. Those are the, the three main ones that he's seen a lot of uptick in and what he's also been um, um, recommending. So. I think it's also important to remember again the before COVID and after COVID phenomenon. A lot of folks who have been on a track are going to stay on that track even while the world takes a little bit of a turn. Some of the incumbents in all of these areas are, are going to fail to adapt uh, very nimbly. Others are going to adapt in response to new trends triggered by COVID. So watch for those. Don't watch too hard the existing incumbents. Uh, watch for new entries and how those incumbents adapt. Great. And Cal, I think there was a second part of the question too, if you wanted to sort of repeat it. Um, it was just more about the impacts of COVID-19 on ESG investing expectations. So I think we, we kind of already highlighted that. And, and I can add a little bit to that. I know we've talked about it, but I think, you know, we, we've said that for investors, this is kind of an opportunity to see who's walking the walk on ESG. So advocates are watching whether companies that talk about prioritizing stakeholders and putting purpose ahead of profits will stick to those principles in a crisis. And it is a bellwether for investors for structural risks in companies, how they're approaching long-term risks like continuity planning. For the most part, uh, investors are signaling that they're continuing to hold companies accountable um, on things like climate change. So BlackRock, for example, has indicated that it's going to continue to target companies and it's already voted against um, the re-election of board members at a few different companies because of their failure to disclose on climate related risks. Um, on the other side, you know, UNPRI, which is a group of uh, prominent, you know, 3,000 investors dedicated to responsible investing, they've recommended um, that investors focus their engagement with companies on their response to coronavirus and that they postpone discussions on other topics. Um, however, they're saying that climate change will still be a key topic. We also expect investors to focus more on social and governance issues, uh, especially in the short term. And when it comes to things like the treatment of employees, I think investors will look, um, you know, to corporate responses to coronavirus as a proxy for uh, their broader approach to human capital management. And of course, issues like executive pay, corporate bailouts and buybacks have also moved front and center. So um, all of this is certainly an added reputational risk to manage. Uh, and lastly, you know, ESG strategies are still kind of untested, but evidence suggests that they've been more resilient um, and that U.S. sustainable funds are weathering the coronavirus, you know, correction a little bit better than most funds. So that could lead to uh, a surge in ESG investing because of this. So I know we're almost coming up on the hour here. I'm going to make an executive suggestion in my non-executive role that we uh, stay on a few minutes more to answer just maybe two or three more questions. Um, for those that have to spin off, we will be sharing a recording as well in addition to the slides. Um, so you can expect that in the days ahead in your inbox. Uh, again, we're going to answer a few more questions here, and then we'll wrap up and just remind you of what's ahead and what additional or where you can go for additional information. In fact, you know, because some people might have to peel off, why don't we go to that last slide now? Um, there we go. Eric, um, do you want to just highlight again what's ahead and then maybe we can pivot back to a few more questions? 
Yeah, I mentioned this earlier. Just um, go to future500.org slash summit to learn more about what we have coming up. We've uh, touched on many of the, se uh, the sessions that are going to be happening, um, whether it's with Bill Weil uh, at Climate Voice or with BP and Nestle this coming Thursday. <clears throat> There's a, an interesting one, again, on uh, kind of the future of uh, climate initiatives with Project Drawdown and the Ocean Climate Trust. And I already mentioned the one about taking back democracy, focusing on investors and um, companies with American promise and the shareholder conference. So hope you can join us for the future sessions as well. Great. Andrea, if you wouldn't mind toggling back to the, uh, the trend slide. Um, where did I want to go next? I, I, there was a couple of questions that came in um, it, in relation to the youth activism one and just thinking about the future of students engaging in this space as well. So first, do you see youth rising up and that will trend changing what students want from business schools, internships, uh, career opportunities, et cetera. And then a, a similar question came in from the Q&A, which was, uh, as a business professor, professor teaching economics and finance right now, do you have suggestions about the types of content I should be highlighting and deleting for students to prepare them to engage as workers in the post-COVID-19 world? So basically thinking about the future sustainability or just broader, uh, you know, professional, working professionals in this world. How does this trend in COVID-19 more broadly influence that? I can take this um, pretty engaged with my, my schools, my graduate schools. Um, first off, I do think students across uh, uh, graduate school and undergraduate programs have really been mobilizing to pressure their administrations to get on the right side of a variety, of, to, from the student's perspective, on the right side of a uh, whole host of issues like climate change. and um, I think that uh, academic institutions are very slow to change, and so this has created a lot of, of conflict um, with, within these institutions. And I do think that that's going to just persist and continue. Obviously, we're in a little bit more of a down economy now where uh, unemployment's going up, so it's easier to, to live and breathe your values when um, you're less concerned about getting a job. So it remains to be seen if that activism may wane somewhat, but my general sense is that it won't. Uh, that this is kind of the, the current cultural trend within this generation, emerging generation, and that companies who are really competing for the best and the brightest, even in the even in when the economy was strong, are still going to need to do so because uh, those employees will be in high demand. So, for competitive reasons, um, I do think it's important that companies really try to reach out and understand where this generation is going, and for schools to help prepare those students to have their voice, to to know how to to lead cross functionally within companies, and to really uh, motivate change uh, within corporate institutions. Yeah, I, I think I'll add one thing here. It's a little bit higher level. Um, but what I'm hearing a lot is that the age of specialization might be a thing of the past. And that really what um, folks find compelling, both from a sustainability but broader societal perspective as well, is generalist. People who understand a lot of different issues and know how to connect the dots between them as we think about systemic change. So I would say, you know, both from what we can anticipate students and youth uh, people looking for in jobs and also what we can be teaching them, it's making sure that they have the capacity to be able to connect the dots, whether, you know, they might be specializing in engineering, but need to understand sustainable design and circular economy or someone who specializes in marketing and communications, but understands how to talk about climate change in a really thoughtful way as well. So thinking about that cross-pollination of across historic areas of specialization, I think is gonna be really important. I think it's a great point, Kellen. And I, th I think, you know, to some extent, the current generation may experience what my parents' generation did. They were in, they were in the Depression and World War II, and they were, you know, dubbed the greatest generation by Tom Brokaw because they had become so multifaceted, capable of excelling in many different areas and meeting the challenges that they, that they, that they, uh, that, that uh, face them. Uh, we may have the greatest generation now as our children uh, if they can learn from this set of experiences. Great. I'm going to do one more question on employee activism and then wrap up with a final question after that. Um, there were a couple questions that came in around employee activism, and I'm hoping people can just pontificate a little bit more in general about this trend. Um, one is, okay, we've been kind of generalizing from the experience of big companies where employees potentially have more anonymity, and so they feel more maybe safer um, 
sharing their voice, I guess, with their leadership on these issues. But for an employee at a smaller medium enterprise, there's not necessarily as many places to hide once you go public with demand. So how do we see this trend trickling down to smaller businesses? Um, and then once again, uh, the COVID-19 layer on top of that, it would just be great to, to talk about, you know, we're seeing a lot of layoffs and furloughs right now. How will this influence employee activism? Is it going to make them feel more empowered, more disempowered? Will they be speaking out more after they leave companies or once they're laid off? What's that going to look like? So smaller enterprises and the COVID-19 impact, I guess, are the, the summary of that question. Yeah, Kellen, I'll jump in here first and then happy to have uh, other, other team members' thoughts. Um, I think two things first off. One is that, I mean, this this crisis has provided a really interesting um, look at employee activism because some of these issues are so critical and so top of mind. And so I think a lot of um, workers are feeling like, you know, my moment is now and this matters so much to me. It's personal, right? I mean, so other issues have been very important, but this is personal in a way like no other issues are per have been recently. And so I think we're seeing a lot of people kind of step out and, you know, kind of find their voice in a way they might not have otherwise um, without this crisis. And I think that that will linger. Um, you know, I mean, we, we are seeing headlines about company retaliation against some workers, unfortunately. Um, but I think workers are feeling like this is just such an important moment that they, they are willing to step up. And then the second point I wanted to um, share is just that we're seeing so much support from, um, you know, the advocate community and from other stakeholders, as well as workers joining forces with each other. And so that I think provides some cover while you're, I think, the, you know, the, um, asker of the question is absolutely right. There's sort of nowhere to hide in a small or, or, or medium-sized company. Um, I think the fact that workers are getting support from you know, maybe workers in another department or another part of the company or even from outside the company helps everybody kind of feel emboldened together and not so isolated and kind of being that one person to step out. Yeah, Ellen, I'll, I'll jump in here just for a second. I think the COVID dynamic is really interesting because it could go a couple different ways. One, you know, if people are laid off, then maybe they feel like they have nothing left to lose and they're, they, and they're frankly more vocal. Conversely, one of the reasons I think employee activism has ramped up is because the unemployment rate was so low that comp the employees felt like their companies didn't have anywhere to, else to go to get really quality talent, particularly in the tech sector where it's become, recruitment's become so competitive. And so if they, if there's now suddenly a massively open job market and a ton of people searching for opportunities, employees might actually not feel as empowered to speak up because they feel that there's a greater risk that they could be laid off after the fact or more punished for it, I guess you could say. I think it's also important to realize, uh, though, that there's a different set of employees that are becoming activated by the current crisis. And those employees are more the ones that go and create things. They, they go to solve problems. So they're not necessarily just demanding change from their small employer or their large employer uh, or from the government and so on. Those things are continuing, no doubt but they're also getting together and actually creating change. That's a tremendous opportunity for us to use the energy of the protest and the warrior and the demanders to actually drive problem solving at all levels. So I'm gonna to pivot to our final question. I know folks are happen to jump off now and go to other things. I appreciate all those that stayed with us. This is a little bit bigger and a little bit more timely for the moment came in from Stuart Williams. And it was the question is, what do you think capitalism after COVID-19 will look like? And he gave an, an A, B, or C answer, and you guys can uh, choose one of those or pivot off of it. But A, back to the status quo. B, carry the best forward while leaving the worst behind. C, total transformation. So let's open it up to the entire team. A quick round, Robin, if you want, um, or whoever wants to chime in. What do you think that capitalism will look like post-COVID? Big question. There was no well, option, the option to again? the worst forward. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. All right. We found the test on the team, Eric, right? or Brendan. Thanks. Anyone? That's just a Talk question that begs for me to answer. So uh, I'll, I'll answer it. I think that, you, you know, there's a tendency to blame capitalism for everything we have, depending on how you uh, define capitalism. 
but really I think what we've seen here is industrialism and it's in, in the industrial form of capitalism. So all three of those things will happen now. Uh, there will be total transformations, local economies beginning to emerge, but also a retrenchment to the old and so on. It really is up to us to choose which one is possible. I look at it as a rainforest. Uh, you know, in rainforests, they go through their industrial stage. That's when the big generic giants grow up and dominate a forest. But those are extremely vulnerable species. But what they do is they create local opportunities for growth. And that's what I expect the, uh, the global culture can move toward. The challenge is that we have a lot of vested interests kind of stuck in the process that prevent that natural evolution. So my belief is we could, this could get a lot worse and we could have the worst of big capitalism, uh, industrial capitalism, but we could also have the best of a decentralized, smaller is more beautiful uh, with plenty of big ones to, uh, to thrive as well. And Bill, we got a comment from Bruce Clafter who said this is an opportunity for us to revisit the concept of industrial ecology. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to reissue my book from the year 2000. <laughs> okay. Working back to my old professor, Thomas Gradle, <laughs> there you go. There you go. who wrote one of the first books on that. The um, one thing I was going to say is I think it's going to depend on different industries. I think some will be more will, will be more open to transformation. Others will be more resistant to change. And uh, you know, it's kind of a play on our brand, right? <clears throat> the Future 500 stands for who will be the Fortune 500 companies of the future. And uh, I do think that this. COVID-19 uh, moment is going to create a significant transformation who we see in that 500 in, in a decade from now. Yeah, no doubt. and as a counterpoint, I would say maybe see, but slowly. And I think the coronavirus has laid bare some of the issues with economic systems and, and equity uh, issues that are, you know, endemic to the way that our economy is set up and, you know, due to unregulated capitalism. Uh, so I think, you know, people are thinking about this. And I think especially younger kids who grew up during a recession and now, you know, a second recession will be um, paying attention to this. This is going to change their, you know, thought process. Um, and, you know, th this idea of moving towards a purpose-driven economy, it, it seems much more likely when we think about all of the issues that people are, are dealing with now. So hard to say. That'll be well, a major thanks, growth industry is futurism. So. Hmm. There you go. It's been great. Really, thank you, team, for uh, leaning in and preparing for this. Thank you, EarthX, and uh, uh, for really being a, a great partner and pivoting with us along to do this well. And um, and we'll leave you all to uh, to the rest of your weeks and your days, wherever you're quarantined. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs>